<laughs> uh, next month, I'm really excited. We've got a guy, a gentleman, his name is Stoney Wilson. And when Stoney was in college a while ago, he wrote his dissertation on how to help creatives make money. He currently owns a company called um, Content Makers, and they write for websites and blogs and social media. I have challenged Stoney to come and talk about how do you figure out what to write, how do you figure out how to say it so that you can take people to the next step. Um, and there's, you know, everybody's all about social media, and I am as well, and that's important. But if you're not engaging people, if you're not starting and continuing a conversation, if you're not saying something that is honest and true and attracts attention, right. then um, you're whistling in the wind, as we like to say. Right. So I'm really excited to have him. He has a number of clients. He's all about keeping conversations going. So I put down some things that he'll be addressing, and that is next month. So the third, third, third Wednesday of the month. Um, we've got some... We'll talk. Um, I, other piece of my note, we were talking about it earlier. We are bringing Pierre back in September. If you go to my favorite art place, log in, uh, click on calendar. Uh, <coughs> I think we've got four people already signed up. I think he cuts it off at eight. So it's $125 for five weeks, it's $25 a week, and it's, the sec it's uh, Tuesday nights, two hours. And it's focus on your talent, and so the joy of here is if you're not feeling focused on your... So, I'm always listening to artists say, I mean, you guys have never said this to me before, it's the people who didn't show up. <laughs> you know, I just want to do my art. I don't want to market. That's true. I don't know where to put it. If I just had somebody to put my art out there for me, <laughs> all would be fine. And as you know, I don't really listen to that crap because I think it's really important for an artist to be face to face with a potential purchaser because that's how you find out are they interested or are they not interested. Right. Well, Sarah disagrees with me. Sarah thinks, <laughs> and Sarah's actually an artist too. She's a beautiful painter, and um, I guess she got tired of listening to people, and she likes to talk to people, and so she has put together a really, really interesting business model. We'll hear about that after. What I want her to share with first, and she doesn't know I'm going to say this, so if she just looks at me like, what the, because this is what I told everybody you were going to do. She has for several years been working with organizations, with companies, with restaurants, with public spaces, um, negotiating on behalf of artists, putting together pop-up shows, and so I want first, at some point, for her to share what the art scene is in Tampa, mm -hmm. who's doing what, how people are receiving, how things are selling, what kinds of things are selling. That's what I was going to ask her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and she then sold some of my pieces at some of the I saw that. Things, yeah. I saw that. And then um, integrated into that, I told her that as long as she gives everybody really useful information, she can give some shameless promotion about Galleries on the Go, which is a great program that's growing. So enough of Jerry. Um, let's hear from Sarah Mullins. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Here and eat my dinner. Well, so um, Jerry actually did send me an email with those topics in mind, and so I, I just printed that out so I would remember what she was asking me to talk about. And um, just want to thank you for being here. I think very highly of what Scott and Jerry do here, and I've been here a number of times because the information that you get here is so very valuable. And if you only take away one thing from each evening, then you've learned something, right? Um, and I, I've heard it said that if you spend three years, if you spend an hour a day for three years, it's the equivalent of a college education on a particular subject that you can actually become a, you know, a, um, an expert in that field. And so if you've got a particular area that, that you either are interested in or you want to pursue, you know, just spend that hour every day 
first thing in the morning or last thing at night. You know, we it's such a great time to be in business because <laughs> we've got all these gadgets that can help us stay connected to everything at every hour of the day, month, year, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a great time to be in business and be alive, I think, and, and conduct, um, you know, social connections and all that. So I want to thank um, the Manals for having me and thank you for coming out. Um, so I just want to see, are, is everybody a photographer here? How many photographers? Um, I am. Okay. And how many actual two-dimensional artists do we have? Any painters and digital artists? No, digital, okay. And then I, I heard you're a seamstress and, she and does everything. Okay. <laughs> what what else? What have I not covered? Anything else that y'all do that I I didn't call out? Okay. So we're all creatives here, no matter what we're uh, putting together, and uh, we're about trying to get our creative work in front of other people who appreciate it. It's interesting as I talk to people, um, they say, oh, I don't have a stitch of talent in me. I just don't have any creative ability. I'm so jealous. And I always say to them, well, we need both, you know, <laughs> because if we all created, there'd be no one to appreciate it, you know, and purchase it. So we, we, we need that too. And then they're like, they, they act like they're relieved. Oh, okay. I don't have to be creative, um, which I find hilarious. So, um, Working with different venues, so the question basically is um, what Jerry had sent to me was what people are looking for in art. And art is a, we're going to use that as just a broad uh, subject, you know, covering a lot of different creative activity. What are they looking for? Well, I kind of hate to say this, but it is the honest to goodness truth because I've, I've probably talked to thousands of people in the last three years when I started my business as individual and unique as you are in your taste and what you create is the same way that the onlooker is individual in their in their taste and what they look for. Um, we have honestly sold just about every type of artwork in within my concept that there is from realism to abstract and everything in between. So um, it never hurts to keep putting your stuff out there if there's something you particularly like to do um, I really enjoyed what you were saying about finding that, finding that theme or that, um, what was the word you were using? Style. Style, you know, uh, particular style. And artists will ask me, well, what should I create? Should I create for the market or create for myself? And my answer is yes, do both. Because you need that creative outlet to do what you want to do. It keeps you stimulated and excited about what you're doing. But you do also have to pay attention to what the market will buy. So there is that sense in which abstract art is uh, a more refined taste. People who will buy abstract art are usually in a little bit different economic um, state. Uh, they're a little high, more highly educated. They're more sophisticated in terms of what they understand about art and can pr appreciate what abstract art is. So if you're looking to sell abstract art, you need to look to an audience or a buyer who is in that realm. In other words, that's your demographic. That's a big word. But your demographic is, you know, this person has a little bit more money. This person lives in a little bit better neighborhood. Mm -hmm. This person has traveled. This person is probably a little more educated. And I, I use the example of Thomas Kincaid. I don't really care for his art. <laughs> yep. um, but he understood who his market was and he, and he exploited it to the max and so the biggest part of the population is going to be the person who um, who doesn't quite have that same sophisticated taste they know what they like and it's it's usually more realism or a little bit of surrealism or um, photorealism you know photography is big right now I sell a lot of photography in what I do <clears throat> um, and your question, Jerry, was how your group works. So um, I'm just going to give you a little history about myself. I lost my job in 2010. I was a sales and marketing rep for a, an assisted living community. Made a really fine salary, and I was really happy at what I was doing. But the, the economy fell. A lot of people weren't moving into assisted living. They were just staying in their homes and making do. And you know, if you look at me, you realize I'm not 20. So um, the people that they were hiring at that time were much younger than me and willing to work for a lot less. 
So my husband, bless his heart, said to me, well, why don't you take up your art? And I have a business degree. And I was like, right, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make a living at art. And, um, and I thought, well, while I'm searching for a job, I'll, I'll just piddle with it. I'll just see what happens. And so I picked up my paintbrushes and bought a tent and all that kind of stuff that they tell you to do. And, um, and I did indeed sell, in about an 18-month period of time, I sold about 50 of my own pieces. Mm. Um, but I learned a lot in that process, you know, getting to talk face to face with people and understanding why and why they buy. But then also, not coming from an art realm, talking to the artists about why they do what they do, and then realizing this is a really crazy way to make a living. Outdoor <laughs> shows, you know, who does that? I don't know any business in the world that has a business model like that. What if it you know? rains? <laughs> rains, and Too and hot. I'm a watercolorist, and so those are framed in glass, right? <laughs> So my final day at an outdoor show was in Dunedin in February. The wind got up and the rain started pelting. And I'm not kidding you, I almost lost my tent. I'm standing there holding on to it. And I lost about three pieces end over end. They, they just went. Glass everywhere. And I got worried that I was going to damage somebody else's art, you know, across the, the walkway. And um, I thought, okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's not relaxing. Uh, no, <laughs> and and so you know when you start counting up all the inventory that you have to have for a decent show, what that cost is and the amount of labor, and what those three pieces represented to me in terms of labor, and then not only that but the you know the out, the fees for the outdoor show, and then if you don't take your lunch, you got to buy lunch, and if you don't do this, you don't do that, then pretty soon you've spent way more than you ever intended to. So. That just didn't make logical business sense to me. And um, so I, I actually tried to stay away from the traditional arts groups on purpose because what they want you to do often is to volunteer and serve on their committees and all this kind of nonprofit stuff. And I just didn't have time for that. I'm 57. And I thought, I, I just, I'm never going to make it if I have to go that route. So I need to find a different way. So for any of you that are faith-based, I, I, I did this. I need a big idea. <laughs> so that's how that was born. And um, what I have found is that people still want and need art, regardless of the economy. They still crave that. They still crave the tactile experience, even though we have huge Internet presence now with all of that stuff going on. They will look at it. But I'll tell you, my husband, he likes to shop online, but he'll actually go to Home Depot and look at the product first and hold it and turn it over. Then he'll go back and order it online. <laughs> So they do, people still do really like that tactile experience. To look at it, behold it, walk around it. <clears throat> do you feel that's true? Do you feel people still like to look at the art? No, they absolutely, still absolutely. I never believed that <clears throat> people would spend a thousand dollars or more on a little JPEG for a piece of art. And they're starting to do that, but still, <clears throat> majority of people, unless they're really wealthy, I mean, they want to see it. What is this, you know? Yeah. What's it made out of? What is the it majority. Like? Yeah. Is it true? Is it quality? Right. The only people that I know of that are spending that kind of money uh, and more than that kind of money online are actually the wealthy who, um, who are purchasing works of art um, like from Christie's and Sotheby's, the big auction, art auction ha houses, and they're, they're looking at it as an investment in a well-known artist. Right. The collectors. The collectors. Um, and, and the Chinese are spending a lot of money on that kind of art. They, they have more confidence in our economy than they do in their own. So to them, it's like banking that money. So they'll buy that kind of thing. Now people do, and obviously Scott and Jerry sell a lot online, but there's still that experience of touching the, the buyer, being able to talk to them, have that relationship with them. So we still do a lot of that. Um, people, I think, are going to get tired of that cold experience. Um, I think the younger generation that we're calling Gen Z now um, are they're kind of getting away from um, the you know the constant cell phone Facebook interaction and now they want to form groups and get together <laughs> so they find each other there and then and then they'll meet. Well, I think I think one a huge aspect of it is that people want to interact with the artist. Yeah. And they, they want to like you and they want to be like you you know and then they'll buy your artwork. But surprisingly, you know, you go to the art gallery. It's amazing. You expect them to be really crowded, but they're not. Mm -hmm. So, no, yeah, yeah, there's people, but not enough of them. 
What is that? I'm sorry. The art galleries. Art galleries. Well, I'm going to touch on that. In a up minute. in Chicago, the art galleries get a better turnout, but still, you know, down here, I think kind of you go to art gallery and yeah. yeah, there's a few people there. That's about <laughs> it. You know. So I'm going to I'm going to touch on that in a little bit yeah. with my slide presentation. So. Um, Am I missing something that you were wanting me to cover so far? Keep going. Okay. You're doing awesome. <laughs> so, you know, I needed a big idea. I wanted to find out if there's another way to do this. And, and that's what I set out to find out. Um, and an opportunity came across my, my desk or my uh, personal life that I looked into and, and really discovered um, a kind of a hybrid uh, model, business model. So. <coughs> People do still want that that personal touch. Um, they stu they still want to be able to um, either talk to the artist or contact them in some way or find out more information about them. But people are also busy, and so. Um, it's probably why Jim Warren does so well. I'm sorry. It's probably why Jim Warren does so well. <coughs> well, and everybody has their own style of contacting, you know, because truthfully. Thomas Kincaid, and I'm, I, again, I don't care for his art, but he understood his market. Eventually, he, you, couldn't, you could hardly ever see him. You saw one of his interns or his, you know, his associates that did. He so barely does his own paintings anymore. Well, he's dead. <laughs> so, yeah, he's not, he's <laughs> well, not painting. True. I mean, <laughs> you know, but, he was alive. Yeah, so, he so, but he had built his reputation to a point where people didn't care anymore. You know, they were just happy to have his work. And so now you see it, it really was about branding himself. It's a brand. You know, he discovered that style and he right. stayed with that. Now, I get tired of that after a while, but I do know that if I've sold a particular piece at least once, then there's a likelihood there's going to be other people that like that piece again. You know, so right. prints and all that make, make perfect sense. Keeping records is important, you know, what you've sold and so forth. And so, um, so my group is more about how I could make the art available to the public where they are, instead of going to this tent show, and instead of galleries, the traditional galleries, how could I get the artwork out there where the people are? Because the biggest expense and the biggest effort is getting the people there. So I, I felt like I found a solution to that. And not only that, I, I knew there were artists who worked full time. That really, that just seemed overwhelming and exhausting to them to try to find a way to show their art. Where am I going to go? Oh my gosh, what are you telling me? I have to set up a tent on the weekend and I've just worked 40, 50, 60 hours this week. No way. No way. So um, finding something that would work uh, not only for the artists, but for the, the venues that we're in and, and that made sense for everyone. And then um, one of Jerry's questions was how you've made adjustments based on the market. So um, uh, trying to understand how the economy affected what we're trying to do. And I've heard artists say, well, I'm not selling my art for less than $1,000. I'm just not doing that. Well guess what? <laughs> if people aren't spending a thousand dollars, that's going to stay under the bed. That piece of art's going to stay under the bed. Or that photograph. That's just going to stay where it's at. It's not that your art's not worth it. It's that people aren't spending that. And, you know, during the recession and shortly after, people were putting off um, the big purchases, which is like, well, I can't buy a car this year. Well, we need to put a roof on, but we're not doing that this year. So as soon as it started to get better, those were the things they were spending on first. But that did not mean, I had artists say to me, oh, art's not selling, art's not selling. But those two years in 2011, 2012, Christie's and Sotheby's had record art sales. Record, ever, in the history of their organizations. So somebody's buying art, who is it? And then I made trips around to the big box stores, Target and, and Ikea and, you know, some of those to see what was out there. Well, they had bins full of art and you go online, it's all selling. So <clears throat> that told me that people, people still wanted, they still wanted art somehow, some way. And they were going to find a way to get it. Maybe they weren't buying in record numbers like before, but they were certainly buying. 
So I, I always tried to talk to the artists a little bit about, you know, we are competing with a Chinese market, unfortunately. Um, and so we have to figure out how to do that, you know, maybe spend less on supplies and spend a little more on marketing myself. You know, why do I need a thousand of the same kind of picture? Or why do I need, um, I, I usually speak to two-dimensional artists, painters. They'll spend all day buying art supplies and have a jillion things falling out of their closets and drawers that they're never going to use. But they don't even think about spending money on themselves to market what they have. And so I do try to encourage folks, you know, get to a point where you have a decent inventory but then figure out what you can afford to spend on marketing yourself and what does that look like? What does that mean? Um, and there, we could spend all evening you know, talking about how to do that. But um, I do have a couple of solutions I think are, are good for everyone, good for the artists and good for the venues where, where we are. So adjusting your price, you know, you don't want to undercut yourself, you don't want to put yourself in the hole, but making adjustments to the market that makes sense for you and then finding ways to cut costs that don't give you a cheap product. Um, you know, trying to maintain that quality. You don't need <coughs> quantity necessarily as much as you do a, a decent inventory and then a means to show that to people. Um, because after all, you can paint it, but they're not coming because they don't know you. <laughs> so you gotta go, you know, where the people are. And where are they and understand that a little bit. Understand who's looking at social media and why understand what age group and who's buying and why. Um, so you make those adjustments, you get through it, you know, you, you bear down or, you know, some people say you hunker down, you know, and get through those hard times. And for you, it may just be right now. It's not based on the economy. It's I'm not selling anything and I don't really know where to go from here. So it might just be hunker down a little bit and take a, you know, full examination of what your activities are. If you can't market it, then align yourself with somebody who can help you do that. You know, maybe it's a friend who's not an artist, but they absolutely love what you do. And I just had that happen this year where um, this gal was an amazing photographer. She was just doing point and shoot camera out on the golf course, but she's got these incredible animal shots and she's selling like crazy. Um, it surprised both of us. Um, but she'd never, she's been taking pictures all these years that never ever shown them to anybody ever <laughs> she's just keeping it all to herself so you know they're not going to come looking for you you got to get out there where's she selling them? well through my through my gallery oh, okay. um, locations but i'm i was the first opportunity you know i just encouraged her a little bit and said here's what i think you need to do you know i think these are the prints that'll do well and and they have you all have any questions before I get into this little presentation? Okay. <laughs> Y'all are quiet. <laughs> so the why for me was art Art for me is very personal. It's not just a craft. It's, it's the transmission of my feeling onto something else. So that when a person looks at it, it, it comes back to them. That emotion and that energy comes back. And um, I believe that every artist, I don't know where to stand, so can y'all see? Um, so as I mentioned, I was doing some study. It's not the economy, it's you. This is Danny Johnson, who is ABC's secret millionaire. And her, her philosophy was, you can sell anything in any economy. It's not the economy, sweetie, it's you. In marketing, um, I have a lot of artists, you know, say to me, should I change my prices? And I just felt like there were a lot of artists that were like a ship without a sail. They just didn't, they felt lost, didn't know what to do next. Basic marketing principles, if you're going to try to sell something or market it to someone, there are four Ps. It's either the product, maybe, maybe you need to work on getting your product, you know, at a better, at a better place. Get some input on, on working on that. Maybe it's the price. Maybe it's the place. Maybe I don't have it in front of the right people who can appreciate what I'm doing, right? Um, and then whatever the fourth one is, I'll have to think about that for a minute. But, you know, if you work on those first three, then you've probably got, you've probably got it made. Um, 
So should you change your price? Well, ask yourself that question. Can I live with a little bit less if I've sold it rather than take it home? Now, you were talking about museums and galleries. Um, they have a nonprofit philosophy, and this is where I find trouble with it. They just want to sell tickets. <laughs> they don't want to sell art. They want you to donate your art so they can sell tickets to their entity. So I had a, a gentleman, he had just inherited a 7,000 piece print collection from a, uh, a distant relative. And these were mono prints, which are um, you know, one of a kind. And he said, I've, I've talked to all the museums, and he goes, they just want me to donate my stuff. You know, I said, well, yeah, because they want to sell tickets. Mm -hmm. they don't, and he said, I don't get anything. I know, I know. And so then I asked people, are you for or against profit? What do you want? You know, don't give yourself away. You know, have enough pride in yourself that you, that you uh, are willing to get a price for it. Galleries want you to take the initial risk by developing a long resume. Well, you got to go to this show and you got to get that prize and you got to make sure you're in that gallery and you got to have this long list before they'll even take you. So they take you on consignment, they'll invest their money in it, but you have to prove that you've already been selling. So, so then what? What if you're my age and I don't have time to build a long award resume? And people will say, well, you know, it's exposure. Well, you can't, <laughs> you can't pay your mortgage with exposure, right? You need to get something sold. So it's like pitching a very large ball into a tiny mitt. So I'm just gonna throw my art out there and see what happens. No, you need to have a plan. Where to go? So galleries, the statistics show that attendance is down. You were talking about how they're, they're, they're just empty. And it's true. People, I, I have personally surveyed Dozens of people. When was the last time you went to a gallery? When was the last time you went to a gallery? And almost without exception, they say, I can't even remember when I went to a gallery. They just don't go. I go. Um, I go. <laughs> well, I do too. And they should go a lot more, actually. Well, Every see, weekend. so attendance is down. So the advent, there's the advent of virtual galleries, which is the online gallery, and the artists who still <clears throat> want to create, but they have little time to develop a long bio. Most artists I know are either working gainfully or are retired, you know, so they've worked and spent their time and now they're, um, but that gate, that, that whole gate of gallery um, and museum is, is narrowing. So the solution is to go where the people are, and I developed a unique blend of gallery and virtual, so we do have a website presence, but um, looking at what are other ways that we can um, develop getting the art in front of people where it makes sense. And then looking at what is the future of art. And I've already mentioned Thomas Kincaid. I'm not going to go back through that. So you know, it's so... Will you go back and talk about the art on demand kiosk? So this kiosk here, I saw in an Atlanta um, gallery, museum actually, um, they had a special presentation with classic cars and so they walked you through you know you looked at all the drawings and the actual cars and then when you came out of course this was the gift shop and they had this this art on demand kiosk since that time I've seen it in at least two other um, art museums what is it is it just a, a so they they or? have loaded on that touch screen you know whatever that it's I'm sure it's just a you know, computer of some kind and it's got a touch screen loaded on that, everything you just saw in the gallery or museum. And you can stand there and scroll through the artwork that's there that you just saw and ch choose one. And then if you can see that at the top there's four different styles of framing. They're all very, very simple but with different coloring. You can pick your frame, and then it's shipped directly to your home. So you, you know, credit card it, and then it's shipped out. So, um, so that's yes. that's new for a, a gallery, then, because well, museum. I'm thinking museums. They don't sell. <coughs> you're the there gift shop. in the gift shop. In the gift shop. Yeah. But I tried to contact this company, and they're only working with a handful of 
of ga galleries or museums. So I don't know what the holdup is on it. I don't know why they don't just you know roll that out because it seems like the technology is so simple. And then what's RFID? RFID is the chip on your credit card. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when you say the future of our inventory is RFID. Right, so looking to the future, how does the future look in marrying art and technology? And um, I believe it's chip technology. And so um, we're currently looking into how to help organizations and institutions inventory. There are a lot of schools and universities that are still doing it by paper on hand, you know, by hand. So um, trying to, to see how we can help them um, speed up that process and have really accurate records. Oh, God rest his soul. Um, he was a marketer. There's just no two ways about it. Here are some case studies that I pulled out. You probably can't see all the print, but the top one, Ed Rusha, um, in 2004, his painting was purchased at $480,000. Three years later, it nearly doubled in price. Um, this artist below, Beatrice Milhays, in 2006, her piece was purchased at 190 and in 2008, more than doubled in price. And the only reason I pull that out is because um, people do really value having art. They do really value having something that's created by someone else on their walls. And, and the values are coming back up uh, in spite of the economy. Um, and then I won't go into all of that, but um, so who's your audience? Who is my audience? So I spend time going to building managers, um, town halls and municip municipalities, decorators, realtors, furniture stores, and new construction. And I'm sure those are probably very similar to the, the kinds of audiences that uh, Scott and Jerry um, have. We have 14 locations now in the Tampa Bay area where we show artwork, including an exclusive contract with Ruth Eckerd Hall and an exclusive contract to represent Moffitt, I mean, um, the Morian Art Center in St. Petersburg to lease their art to I have a quick question, buildings. Ruth Eckerd Hall, so is no one else now allowed to show there? Anybody's allowed to show there, but I'm managing it. Well, I've shown there through organizations. So that's no longer going to happen? Sure, it can happen. I just need to be able to talk to whoever is in charge. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there's, there's been no ban. Uh, no, I don't mean it as a ban. Yeah. I just meant. Yeah. I just manage it for them. I have a contract oh, okay. to manage that for them. All right. That's how that works. Okay. Which gallery is in Safety Harbor? Um, actually, that's a, that's a unique one. So my gallery spaces are not traditional gallery spaces. I go into office buildings and municipal halls and I set up a gallery rail hanging system and then we hang the art and it's available for sale. I facilitate the sales and then I um, post it on social media on behalf of the artist. And so Safety Harbor is actually a financial planner's office and it's very small, but they um, are on Main Street there right across from the gazebo. So uh, on the third Friday when they do their music night and the street is um, closed for the street festival, then he opens up his door and we host a little open house right there. Nice. We actually sell more art out of that tiny little space than we have in all of the other ones combined. Wow. It's it, intimate. It totally it? shocked me. Because, it, because it's intimate It's too. the right crowd. Yeah. It's the right people. Um, it's it's the right kind of atmosphere, mm -hmm. you know. It's not just. Yeah. It's just nice, you know. It's nice. Yeah. It's a nice little open house, and um, so. So now the same question is with the Sterling Gallery. Now we would go through you. I don't manage that, but I have a relationship with. Because before they used to have so. open calls. Are they no longer going to have open calls? Oh sure. Sure, I don't okay. manage that. I just have a relationship with them. Okay. So, 
but that's available and so what I do is act as a broker on the artist's behalf I have some people that approach me that want to do solo shows and so you know I can just make those phone calls and try to help make that happen for you at a price <laughs> of course I don't do it for free but mm -hmm. um, uh, so let me tell you about the who's buying art so in my in my quest to find out who that is it's it's 18 to 30 year olds. Mm -hmm. A lot of techies out there, they're getting paid really fine salaries right out of tech school. And they're getting their first apartment or first home or what have you, and they'll buy an important piece to put over the sofa. And then for us, it's the 45 to 65 year olds who are empty nesters, may have a little bit of disposable income for the first time, and they're either downsizing or they're remodeling or they're just you know looking for new right they're just tired of the same old same old and they've always wanted to collect art but perhaps never had an opportunity to do that we've got young crowd that is interested in original art or are they looking for reproductions mostly we've sold both yeah 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 sold both. Or they prefer uh, a copy of a, of a Van Gogh let's say as opposed to an original of an unknown artist how would you well I wouldn't know about Van Gogh because I don't I don't I don't show any uh, classical art. It's no, all local. Anyway, I would turn to saying a, a known, a well-known artist. Uh, would they? Be, I, I know. I have friends that prefer a well-known artist. Mm -hmm. How old are they? Reproduction rather than a mediocre yeah. but how a known old artist. They? You know. How old are they? Uh, Forty. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to depend. The eighteen to thirty-year-olds are not necessarily tied into that classical art. Um, they do like um, oh. They do like more um, graphic pieces, mm -hmm. you know, so if it's photography, they do like like patterns and um, buildings, you know, with, with um, more graphic, strong lines and strong, uh, That's strong presentation. Mm. Yeah. Uh, they like landscapes, famous places, you know, because they do travel. Mm -hmm. And so um, they like to, you know, remember where they've been, get something really nice. Who buys abstract art? <laughs> well, most of the time for us, now I, I can't say across the board, but for us it is the 45 to 65 year olds mm -hmm. who are more educated. 45, not the young ones, though. not the young ones, huh? Um, not so much, right? Not so much. Buys what? So, graphic. Okay. Abstract. 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 Oh, sorry, abstract. But again, that's that's our experience. You know, I can't tell you across the board um, what they're buying. But our experience has been more more to realism. They they're loving the photography. Black and white or color. I'm sorry. Black and white or color. Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. My kids are in their 30s, and they love old black and white movies, which just astounds me. You know, because they're slow and the plots are. Goofy and all that, so anyway. Okay, did I? You had a slide that you didn't talk about, and I want to know what was on that slide. <laughs> uh, well. I think the computer ran out of power. Mm -mm. Is that possible? Oh, it crashed. Oh, there we go. You want that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, back so it's interesting us. that, um, so we, mm -hmm. we started our core business, Galleries on the Go, which is that GOTG, as showing, uh, brokering spaces in public places. That's my byline. So I go out to these public offices and I <coughs> find a space where somebody needs art and then I negotiate with them to come in and hang that gallery rail hanging system and then I go back to the artists and talk to them about hanging their work in that space. Um, and so that was the core business when I started three and a half years ago, finding the venues, facilitating the art sales, and then helping the artists to broker that. In other words, I'm your mouth. And that, that has been working very well. But in the course of that, um, we discovered other opportunities through what we do, and that is um, designing uh, logos and branding for area businesses. Um, one of the municipalities that I had a relationship with 
was wanting to build a monument to the Tokabaga Indians because it's they're named Indian Shores and they're named after that indigenous peoples. So they wanted they wanted an artist to design this public piece of art. And their city manager, who's now retired, came to me and said, we need an artist, but I don't know any. Can you help me? <laughs> well, yeah, I know a lot of artists. So um, I was able to find locate an artist who, who did a beautiful design, and out of that was birthed this whole logo and branding uh, design. And now um, we're in the construction phase, or will be soon, for five wayfinding signs that the artist also designed um, throughout the Indian shores, paid for by Penny for Pinellas for beautification along Gulf Boulevard. So um, we've just installed um, seven bus stop decals based on his design. So if you, if you drive down Gulf Boulevard through Indian shores, then you'll see his big Indian logo design on those um, acrylic decals that are on the bus stops and then come October they will begin construction on these five signs that he's also designed. And the last piece is um, I we also discovered that <coughs> that's part of the graphic vinyl but I also did was able to do a job for um, a large commercial management company um, they have several uh, commercial buildings in Tampa that they they manage and the architect had specified 16 images that were 7 foot by 10 foot that were printed on vinyl and installed in a large atrium so I helped broker that that job as a result of you know the art relationship so um, they they were actually um, images of old Tampa Bay but then I began to realize look at all these photographers out here that have such great work you know that could be so perfect for that kind of thing and um, so we've we've developed that it's it's still in its infancy and then I discovered too that while I was hanging all these pieces of art that hanging acoustic tile was very much like that and there's a company that will print um, any image on a piece of acoustic tile um, so um, we're, we're still developing that that's uh, definitely a revenue stream for us so it's an opportunity again for artists to get as as Jerry and Scott were showing this fabric artists to get their work because the acoustic tile the reason that's important is sometimes people they have to decide we're gonna we got to do something about the sound in this room you know is it art or is it acoustic tile well acoustic tile is very expensive um, but they can kind of have both with um, not kind of I mean it, it's it's both it's art on acoustic tile so Have I bored you silly? No. Not at all. <laughs> Any questions? So how, how many art calls do you currently have going on? So there are 14 venues. We have about 12 um, concurrent exhibits going on right now. And so there's plenty of room. I'm always looking for artists. Artists kind of come and go. They go on vacation. They've got family this or that. You know, sometimes they show, sometimes they don't. Um, so I'm always looking. And um, we're our goal is to have 20 by the end of this year, 20 locations. So, what are your fees? Span. They range anywhere from 10 up to $50 a month. So $10 a month and I take no commission. For what space? For a space about like this, so you could get three or four pieces um, in, in the space that I allot for you. So again, anywhere from $10 a month to up to 50, depending on what the location is. And I try to help guide that because some of the locations I have are beachy, so they're more they're more crafty oriented mm -hmm. and tourist, um, you know, sales. And then the others are more upscale office buildings. And of course, Ruth Eckerd Hall. They they made it very clear that they wanted the um, the artwork to have a higher quality. Mm -hmm. So. Are you seeking any particular kinds of styles or subject matter? No, because we sell it all. Um, so it really, it's great to have a variety. I do try to guide on, um, you know, I want that each artist to have a unique experience with what we do. So I try not to have too many of the same kind of art. 
So it's always good for me to see a selection of what you have if you don't just do one style because if you have something that somebody else is not doing and I, I have access to that, then I can say, you know what, I have too many of the beach scenes, but I really need that. Can you show me more of that? Not only that, but I spend time putting those in front of um, decorators and designers and architects. So I have a list of people that I keep in touch with, and every time I come across a new artist I'm really excited about, I just shoot that in front of them and say, new artist, take a look, please. And, um, and we've had some results from that as well. What's the price range of the uh, art? Um, for what we do, anywhere from 150 to just over $1,000. So we do sell some under $100, but that's again mostly at the beach locations. So if you're framing and all that, that's too expensive. You wouldn't want to, yeah. you wouldn't want to participate in that. But we've sold in every location. Now, so if somebody, oh, do you put the bio of the artist up with the artwork? Um, not always because it gets really cluttered. So we do try to make sure that the information is there if they want to, you know, continue to look for that artist. Um, I have to draw a line as to how much I can really get done, you know. So um, I do try to represent the artist as best I can, but there's just no way to get all of that in that space. So if somebody so. sees a piece and they're interested, there's a gallery to go. Um, there's contact information there, mm -hmm. so they reach out to you. Right. And sometimes they'll say something, I really hate the frame on that, can you get me a different print? So that just happened this week. Well, you knew a good friend. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, you just never know. You know, you frame something, you like it, and it's like, you know, somebody says, that's not going to go in my house. That's not going to look good. So, Now if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, how do they get in touch with you? Good question. So is it okay if I just make these available? Do you want me to pass them? Since this is my shameless... Pass them out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 